conversation of the first day um, last today, but definitely not least an incredible conversation that we are only going to be diving deeper into. Welcome to Disability and Care, um, the conversation on caregiver support and community and the interconnected access with the disability community. Um, correct me on your names at any point, please. I want to learn them. We have um, Amy Chu here, um, an artist, a multidisciplinary artist in Seattle. We have Johanna Maynard Edwards, who is the executive director of the National Women's Theater Festival and a PAL partner. Um, and we welcome Pro Bono ASL. Thank you, Inter interpreters for um, creating access in this space at, um, at our sessions today. Um, I'm going to read our community agreements after Tamanya shares the land acknowledgement. So I'd like to invite Tamanya um, to the spotlight, please. Hello. Um, I am coming to you from the land of the Lene Lenape people whose historical territory includes the places colonially known as Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Long Island, and the lower Hudson Valley. For more than 10,000 years, the Lenape people have been stewards of these lands as well as the river of human beings or the Delaware River. Over the past 250 years, many of the Lenape people were forcibly removed from their ancestral lands and dispersed throughout the country though some families have remained. These families continue the traditions of their ancestors to this day. The violence that removed the Lenape from their homeland is a powerful part of the history of Pennsylvania. And we acknowledge that in this moment that we work and we live on these very lands. This is the story of the entire country. We encourage you to learn about the lands where you live and work and the history of the people who lived there before colonization, many who still live there today, Though they are often starved of the very resources that they protected for so long, including access to housing, sustainable food practices, safety, clean water, and the land where they once lived with their families. This information was provided in part by www.lenape-nation.org. Thank you. And I'm Tamanya Garza, the National Director of Community and Justice Initiatives for PAL. Thank you so much for your work and um, bringing us into that space. We receive and acknowledge that land acknowledgement. Um, some community agreements for all of us in the space, including our participants um, in the Zoom and our participants watching the stream. As a session participant, participant, you commit with us to welcome all caregiving responsibilities and realities in the background or foreground of any meetups, phone calls, and exchanges, and embrace your life in our pursuit of productive and supportive practices. As a session participant, you commit with us to creating a transgender and non-binary affirming space, all language that includes but is not limited to mother, parent, dad, caregiver, etc., applies to any individual who identifies with the term, and we welcome them and support that. As a session participant, you commit with PAL to creating spaces rooted in justice and anti-racism in our structures, practices, policies, principles, and producing. As a session participant, you commit with us to creating safe and supportive spaces for disability access and inclusion and all access needs present in the space. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and welcome. I'll put the community agreements in the chat in case that's a more supportive way to engage with them. Um, and thank you again to our panelists for joining. We're gonna have a conversation um, on the disability community and the interconnected reality of parenting and caregiving um, beyond just parenting. Um, so I would love to invite Amy to uh, self-introduce so that you can share into the space how you would like us to identify with your lived experiences, share with us about who you are as an artist. So who should go first? Is it is it Amy. me? Oh, absolutely, Amy. Yes, please welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy. My sign name is here A on the lip because I have um, this lip gloss right here. I'm an Asian woman, and I also identify as deaf. I am a mother of two children, ages three and eight. I'm a poly writer and actress here in no. 
playwriter. I'm a playwriter. And Sorry. Sorry. Correction. I'm a playwriter. Thank you for clarifying, interpreter. I'm a playwriter and actor. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Johanna, I would love to hear from you. I'm Johanna. I am, uh, I, I run the National Women's Theater Festival. I um, became uh, disabled by a chronic illness that I was diagnosed with in 2017. Um, called Takayasu's arteritis. It's um, a form of vasculitis that affects my large blood cell, my large uh, arteries, my large cell arteries. Um, I am the mother of a brilliant nine-year-old who is on the autism spectrum. And I am a caregiver to parents who are, my father is, has, a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia, and um, a mother who uh, needs extra support and caregiving, and a mother-in-law who um, just got home from the hospital and is um, needs mobility support. So, and obviously I'm the caregiver of this dog who decided to get into the foreground right now. So th those are my disability and caregiving intersections right now. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure. I would actually love to read from your bios and here's the importance of that. I would love to speak into this space, both of your incredible professional contributions and acknowledge that you are extraordinary artists who we all should be grateful to know. So I'm sharing this now. Um, Amy is a deaf multi-hyphenate. This summer, she performed in Children of a Lesser God at Hope Summer Repertory Theater. Prior acting credits include Please Untranslate Me at IRT Theater, Kiki's Delivery Service at Theater Battery, and Understudying at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Directing credits include Tiger Style at Huntington Theater. Playwright credits include Thoroughly Zoomed Out at Ars Nova, Mother Clucker Theater Battery, and Humanly Possible at Deaf Spotlight. Her short play Plum Crazy Pipe Dream was selected for an expanded 2022 production at the Deaf New Play Festival hosted by Rochester Institute of Technology and TID. She is currently preparing to workshop a new play, Autocorrect Thinks I'm Dead. Amy is a mother of two. Amy, thank you so much for bringing your full self into this incredible space. Um, and now I'll do the same for Johanna. Johanna Maynard Edwards is the Executive Artistic Director of the Women's Theater Festival based in Raleigh, North Carolina. She has directed, devised, and produced in New York City, Minneapolis, and the Triangle. A passionate arts educator, Johanna has been a teaching artist at Raleigh Little Theater, Arts Together, Sterling Montessori, Learning Spring, North Carolina Governor's School, and at Longleaf School of the Arts. Johanna is a chief rep for PAL, the Parent Artist Advocacy League for the Performing Arts, and serves on the Arts Learning Community for Universal Access through the Office of Raleigh Arts. She also serves on the SCTC Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Access Task Force. Johanna is a graduate of NYU Tisch School of the Arts, Playwrights Horizons Theater School. She resides in Franklinton, North Carolina with her husband, son, their puppy, Rookie, and their three cats, Trixie, Robert, and Emmy Lou. I love those names. Thank you so much, Johanna, for joining us. Um, yes, and we have some hellos happening in the chat. Um, as we're engaging, I would encourage folks who are engaged in the space to start dropping your questions in the chat, and I will start with mine for these incredible speakers um, so we can get to know them a little better. And you may wonder why are we spending so much time learning about these people is because that is the very first step to understanding how to create access. I'm not going to be the one to share that with you. Um, it's going to be centering the voices of the folks who have it. So it's about time. Um, Amy, I would love to start with you. And um, we've, we met recently to have a conversation about caregiver support in Seattle. And I would just love to hear from you um, any past experience or recent experience or inspiration in what prompted the conversation. Yeah. This year, I've had a few experiences. Um, 
me as a mother, there are so many barriers that I have to deal with and I have to be able to accept, you know, the work. Firstly, I did live theater in Michigan in the summer. It was before, uh, <laughs> excuse the interpreter. I was still figuring out the acting at the Bull House. I was wondering if children and family were allowed to stay there um, for this residency program. Because of, oh, because of the, the, the pandemic that was going on. So restrictions for that, allowing that to happen were heightened. That was the first challenge that I experienced this year. Also, I needed to decline the opportunity to do a workshop in New York City because Hmm. Right now I'm transitioning to Zoom, doing remote play uh, work and live theater through Zoom, which means that there's just so much more challenging work um, navigating that. I have to like fly around, leave my children here and then go uh, to a different state. Um, and now we're starting to, I'm starting to think about who else out there is experiencing the same thing that I'm going through. I'm a disabled person, but also it's really challenging, not only as a disabled person, but just as a mother in general. So that's kind of what's been going on with me. Thank you. Everything you shared is so um, relatable or at the very least comprehensible for, for us um, from an empathic standpoint. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the obstacles as, as a mother um, before COVID, what, what was that experience like? Um, because I know that it's just exacerbated, but what were your experiences earlier on? Prior to COVID, um, I still had to depend heavily on family support because my dad is retired. He retired in 2018. So he could babysit my children. But now, I mean, as they're becoming older, I don't want to, or excuse me, as my father's becoming older, I don't want to have to depend on him so much. You know, it's not sustainable. And it's not fair to my dad. I am so grateful for him. I'm so grateful, though. Yeah, that's wonderful. You're describing um, how we we dip into our own pockets of support to create support elsewhere. And that redistribution of resources for the individual can become prohibitive. Um, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Johanna, I'd love to show you, like throw you that we have um, agreements in the chat. Johanna, I'd love to throw you the same, uh, same prompt in terms of, you know, in the first engagement with PAL, we just see ourselves as a, a platform what was your inspiration for, for engaging uh, in terms of your, your own story? Yeah, before I lose that, the train, if I don't, if you don't mind me just yes ending what Amy expressed and just that it seemed, it's like I'm always using all of my caregiver goodwill. Um, like I just used it to go to Miami to be by my mother's bedside for a week. So that means I have no more use of husband resources, right? He had to take off work for all of that. So now we don't have that resource anymore. So it's just, it's a never ending cup of that. Um, but yes, going back to, and I have a cold, so I'm just gonna name that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, when I joined Women's Theater Festival as a volunteer and then a board member, um, it had been after the first three and a half years of my son's life, which were intense to say the least. And um, through the process of his diagnosis and just all of the different 
therapies and supports and preschools and speech therapists, OT, PT, everything a million times a week, medical this and that. Um, I just thought that's what my life was from now on. Like I thought my career in theater was over and that I'm lucky to live in a community like the Raleigh-Durham Triangle area where there's a robust community theater community so that I could just tap into that from time to time. Um, and the Women's Theater Festival came along and it was like, okay. <laughs> it, it was blessed that I was a, a frazzled, worn out mama who just wanted to use her expertise and skill to help build this grassroots organization. And um, actually the month that I moved from board member to managing director of this organization, was just before I was diagnosed with uh, my autoimmune disease. So if anyone here who's been through the process of having something rare and strange diagnosed, you go through a period where you are in agony and nobody knows why, but they can't give you anything for it because to do that would be suppressing what's happening and then they can't do the tests. So it, I was bedridden. I was completely bedridden and I was trying to take the reins as managing director and producing the first show that I was responsible for producing for the organization and, and doing it all from bed. <laughs> um, so like this organization has had to make space for me at the onset in a radical way. And so as I've gone from volunteer to the executive artistic director it's it's my job and my privilege to create other pathways of access you know to say uh, I know what it's like to have many many intersecting needs and many many intersecting reasons why this is hard and and also to to be able to show but aren't I worthy of being here aren't don't I deserve to be in this space too? Don't we all value from what I bring? So yeah, that's, that's where it started. And it's like, it's, it, does it get easier? I don't know. That's okay. Um, thank you so much for all of that. You know, at our first session, Noelle Diane Johnson from Artist Heal, who is moderating the conversation, um, shared the phrase, walking out of the fire, carrying buckets of water for your community. And that's gonna stick with me for the rest of my life. But for this conversation, just um, being able to share or, or I guess engage with your own experiences to create paths for others um, is what you both are doing having this conversation here, but also the work in your life. So I just wanna acknowledge and say thank you for all of that. And also Joanne, it's, it's so interesting, our second session, you know, from, you know, went beautifully with Roberta Pereira, who's an incredible inclusive producer who feels the same way, having this conversation of it's not, do we have the numbers to support people? The question asked is, aren't I worthy that you just phrased? Aren't I worthy? Aren't I valuable? And, um, and identifying what resources we need to find from that perspective is so uh, empowering. And so thank you for introducing that context. Um, so moving from your, you know, moments of inspiration and the paths you're on now, um, I'd love to offer the prompt to both of you and, and, I'll, and I'll offer it back to you, Amy, of what do you wish folks knew in your community about the intersection between disability and caregiving? I wish people, and particularly the theater community, <laughs> oh, I'm unicorns. Oh, I wish people in the theater community were not um, thinking that we're unicorns. Parents who do theater, we're not unicorns, we're there. The we just don't have the resources to do it, you know. We've always been there. 
we need to build this kind of a pathway for people like us. I just don't want to say anything <laughs> about people. We are here. Um, Parents who do theater. Um, recently, I met with somebody, or excuse me, recently I met with Rachel three weeks ago at the Sound Theater Company. And, you know, I used to work there right as a grant writer. And did, I did some PR for Sound Theater. Yeah. I wanted to establish some, you know, um, we want to get a grant for caregiver responsibilities, you know, to provide caregiver, uh, child care responsibilities. And so we wrote a line item in this grant or in the budget rather. And maybe this is the first step. <laughs> And it's just surprising that it's not actually that expensive. It's not like, it's not like to take up all of the budget, you know? But we really, we all have to make this effort in putting in that line item in the grant writing so that we can all have these, uh, maybe, you know, push the agenda of this opportunity. And in the Seattle area, we have a very big theater company, or excuse me, community. <laughs> started with, we need to get the ball rolling now 100 percent. um we have a question in the chat what's the line item for parenting or for disability um and maybe that's not even the binary distinction um if you could expand what you were advocating for that's a great question as for being a deaf theater person my main complaint is um or as a playwright yeah like budgeting for interpreters it's you know it's the budget for interpreters is higher than the budget for hiring a deaf playwright or um a deaf theater person so to speak it's just it's it's not equitable i mean it's not fair (laughs) yeah 100%. So I I just want to circle back this idea of what a phrase to introduce. We are not unicorns in terms of folks with family responsibilities in the theater. Thank you for that. And then to identify the budget line item of, um, you know, making it distinct between ASL interpreters and caregiver support. And then also identifying that when we engage with actual numbers, it is not that high. Um, and that has been a big mission of PAL to advocate for and a perfect transition for me to throw the ball to Johanna Maynard Edwards because this is work that she has also been doing, uh, that she's been applying organizationally, um, which is one of the reasons why the National Women's Theater Festival is the PAL host organization in the Triangle and national partners with us because of their commitment to that budget line item. And Johanna, so if you could first share uh, the prompt, what do you wish folks knew about the intersection between caregiving and disability and then transition, because um, I saw you set up as soon as it came up and I love it, and then transition into um, the budget conversation uh, on the line item for parenting slash disabilities. What I wish people knew is um, how, how tender we are, (laughs) those of us who are facing so much just to get into the rehearsal room. Um, And just, I wish, I wish people understood in an empathetic way how tired I am, (laughs) how tired um, all of us are who are, who are facing these Inter, multiple intersections of what else we have to do with our, our energy and our, our resources of time and energy. Um, and it, and how it's, how it's hard to plan for because it changes, right? My, my needs and, you know, using the spoon theory of, of, uh, Uh, chronic illness and disability of we only have so many spoons of our energy to give each day that can change from day to day from week to week Um, and if my mother-in-law falls 
that changes what I'm going to be able to do at rehearsal that night. If my son has anxiety and refuses to go to school Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, it changes what I'm able to get done each individual day. And there, there's an intersection there with our work in anti-racism in, um, because with BIPOC communities, like we can't control what black person gets murdered that day and people have to come into rehearsal, right? Um, and so just all of these different ways of understanding that we have to loosen our sense of control and perfectionism on our product, our work product, it's gonna, it benefits everyone who is facing a marginalization to do that. Um, but yeah, okay, talking about what line item, is it parenting or disability? It's, this is my favorite thing to talk about as a budgeting person for my organization, is that it's all access. That we have one access line and parent, parenting needs and caregiver needs are access needs. I can't, what do you need to access this process, to access this program, to show up for work with your whole self? What do you need? What are your access needs? And getting super duper comfortable naming all those things. Because we all have to unlearn that we can do that, right? Because we don't know what to ask for if we've never had the opportunity to ask for it. And that's why PAL is such an important organization to say, here's all these things that you could be asking for that you didn't know you could ask for. <laughs> um, so we, in my organization, we put it all as access and then the sub lines are access slash ASL interpretation, access slash childcare, access slash captioning access slash and then down the list of what that service is or what that um, provider is going to be. Does that make sense? 100 percent. Thank you. And I also want to circle back to um, your first response in regards to the tenderness and the exhaustion. I just want to share a, a, a comment was shared. Exhaustion can be a powerful thing with disabilities. And that can be problematic with theater. Absolutely, thank you for, for bringing that into the space, the conflict between even being tired and how engaging with a disability uh, requires your resources in a different way and how the toxic theater culture demands all of your resources all of the time. And so then how is that even possible to contribute if that's the work culture. Um, and I think it's so important because, you know, when folks are looking at creating caregiver support, the danger we always try to warn against is that this is an act of benevolence, that, oh, it's a charity being offered to a niche group who needs our help. When actually we're asking folks to engage with, how does your organization have a conversation on access and care? <laughs> I guarantee you there are folks who do not identify as parents or caregivers who need more care and support if this is a new conversation that you're having. Um, and just to share with folks, we, we recommend the three steps asking, is it legal? Is it ethical? Is it compassionate? Number one, be compliant. Number two, know that it's the right thing to do, not a benevolent thing. And number three, compassion comes in when you have empathy plus action. So these stories are being shared with all of us so that we recognize we're all caregivers at some point. More folks are, have disabilities than even have recognized them yet. So we cannot predict what someone needs unless they have agency to ask for it, unless there's a safe enough space and then there's support to engage. So I just wanna identify that exhaustion uh, being, being a key factor of tenderness, vulnerability, and then honoring what you all put in to be contributors to our field and say thank you. Um, it was shared in the chat, anyone in the theater at any given moment could find themselves in a different or new position in terms of experiencing disability firsthand, and it's short-sighted not to make space for this. Um, and at the same time, someone shared, it is simultaneously true that people underestimate people. 
with disabilities. Um, so I would love to use that as a prompt um, in terms of uh, asking for an example of when you have experienced support that really made you feel honored and seen. Um, and in what do you wish folks knew about folks, uh, folks in the disabilities community who are artistic contributors, how they should be valued um, and not underestimated? What is your, um, what is your hope and, and, and call and challenge to us? And we can start with you, Johanna, and then um, throw the ball to Amy. Hey. All right, it's a two-parter. Let me just reiterate the two parts. That what, say it again, Rachel, for me. Full of support, my fault. I'm getting so excited about this conversation. Or just tell me everything. An example of support where you felt honored. And then two, um, what you wish folks knew about you as an artistic contributor. Like, uh, so um, about why not to underestimate you yeah, as, yeah. as a powerful force. Okay. Um, okay. There's a lot of times that I feel uh, supported, <laughs> but I want to say that the pandemic and being able to make virtual theater and to commune virtually like this has been the most revelatory thing for accessibility. Um, I have just, I've been being able to be very prolific as an artist and as a producer by virtue of being able to do it from home. Naming this very moment, I did not have to get on a plane. I did not have to book a hotel to come to this conference. I did not have to walk up the subway stairs and walk down the subway stairs and do all those things, right? Um, so just making our pandemic shifts have really been huge in terms of making space for more access. Um, more parents can participate if they can do it from home. I mean, yeah, our kids might be screaming in the other room, but we've now gotten used to that, right? And so that, the sh the, anytime people want to shift back or say back to in-person theater, I bristle because I, I like, don't you want me to still get to play? Can't I, I still want to play, but I can't do all, everything that everyone else can do. Um, so I, I think virtual theater would be my overarching answer for ways that I'm able to be supported in the work. Um, I just, I'm freaking out thinking about how, like, just in terms of being an artistic director and standing and welcoming every guest who walks in the door to an opening night feels like, ugh, impossible right now. Um, so that, and it has also allowed me to experience the work of so many people and brought so many other disabled artists to the forefront of me getting to know them and their work, um, like Claudia Alec and the chance to get to work with them through our Fringe Festival and um, just Yeah. 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 So much. Um, ah, hello, Christina, our pal rep in Los Angeles, um, shared the silver lining of this time, more accessibility. I just want to uplift that as well. Um, I, I actually had someone uh, write me um, and, and ask to talk about virtual theater as access for parents. And I'm just going to say a huge yes. I've done more theater and hung out with more theater folks in the pandemic than I have my entire parenting journey. And it's because I don't have to be spending 25 to $30 an hour while I hang out with you and hope we work together one day and just burn that cash. So um, just a huge yes, a huge yeah. yes. Everybody. You're talking about space access too, that your physical body is not being taxed just to greet people 
and make an appearance um, in order for opening night to function. Like to me, if we're talking about not wasting resources, we shouldn't waste the brilliance of who you are as an executive director, because I've seen how you've budgeted and grown this organization in extraordinary ways. And the madness of we could be missing out on your talents and your contribution to this field because we insist on showing up to a building um, is diabolical, I think. Um, it really needs to be abandoned. Uh, yeah. I'm going to say it into this space because I, I live for it. During the pandemic, we increased my organization's revenue by 156%. <laughs> All yeah. of it going back out to pay people. None of it sitting in a cushy little account. 156%. So like that's the power of radical access. Yeah. Yeah. And National Women's Theater Festival intentionally engages with folks with access needs intentionally. And it which is, is the budget. Which is, and I'm, then I'm going to stop talking in seed space, but which is not to say, don't hire me. Don't ask me to come work at your theater. Like it might take me a little bit extra. Like, please, I do want to. <laughs> I do want to come work at other companies. I do want to, I'm ready. My son's nine. I'm ready for contract work. I can leave him home. Come on and hire me, please. <laughs> but but li listen how, and all of these calls so far in the summit and in the whole history of this conversation. Um, and then I'm gonna throw the ball to you, Amy, to ask for your supportive examples and um, what you wish folks knew about yourself as an artist. We are constantly unpacking the binary. Yes, I love virtual theater, but then don't say that you're not going to offer me a job on site. Yes, I love being home with my kids, but then don't ask me to leave them home, not to leave them home and come to your theater. That would be great sometimes too. Please take the either or out of our thinking in terms of access. Give the person agency to say no or yes to an opportunity and then ask what do you need? And that's how the conversation can continue. Um, I would love to hear from you in terms of the time you felt supported and what you wish we all knew um, in terms of the value of you as an incredible artistic contributor to this field. That's a great question. So for my example, there's just so many different things that I've gone through Theater, theater is such a different thing. Um, there's so many ways that you can measure it and it's so different in so many ways. The OSF, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Go ahead, Sarika. Oh, hang on. Sorry. <clears throat> Right, so the OSF is a big part. Um, they, they have a big budget for interpreters, for rehearsals, um, for workshops, just other, you know, other theater things that are related, not just to show. And this is, you know, it's a nonprofit theater, you know, um, they don't have a huge budget, but they show so much support for access needs. They're very flexible with scheduling. They start their table readings early um, rather than later because so, as in um, later in the day so that I can put my kids to bed and then join the table reading. You know, it's things like that kind of schedule flexibility. I mean, there's just a myriad of ways that they're supportive. And I also want people to know support is so being supportive is not an all or 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 like the, the binary you were just talking about earlier, either or. I mean, some people are going to think, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that mom or as a mom, you don't want to, you're afraid to ask for something, <laughs> but you know, go ahead, audition, try and, or go ahead and support this person, try and see what can happen. I don't expect the interpreter, I don't expect interpreters for every single rehearsal. I mean, it'd be great. Or, or like the tech rehearsal or something. And I, I don't expect that, but you know, for the important, really content heavy. Yeah, you even 100%, it's the call to action of do something. 
don't refrain from doing anything because you're afraid you can't do everything. You said, Amy, at the beginning, it all matters, the smallest bit of support. And I think that that's um, incredible wisdom for everyone to adopt. And also, yes, it's mentioned in the chat, shout out to Nataki, um, the artistic director of Oregon Shakespeare Festival, an incredible access advocate, um, a part of Kyle's advisory board and uh, a mother herself, um, but an, an advocate for access and change well before that. Um, so shout out to LOSF and thank you for all you do. Um, yeah, Amy, and I would love to hear about you as, as an artist more about what you wish folks knew um, in terms of the value of your contribution, uh, your opportunity to say, um, I'm worthy of this because I, um, yeah. Hmm. I'm trying to think about something nice to say about who I am. <laughs> I know that might be a little silly. It's a little challenging of a question. So um, I don't know. Uh, hmm. Maybe we can go back to thinking about what's going on now, or I mean, I will, I will hold on to that for now and I'll, I'll put a pin in it and then I'll just think about it for a little bit. And then maybe we can circle back to it later because I'm, I'm, I'm coming up with blanks right now. Yeah, absolutely. I know from personal experience, um, having you in on the calls, I found you to be such a, a generous advocate in seeking out ways that you could improve your own organizations internally to creating support for other people because of your lived experience. So we'll definitely circle back to that. And I just wanna acknowledge my firsthand experience of you as a contributor in this space, um, as someone folks should be bringing into all of their theaters. Um, awesome, we are, we're nearing the Q and A time for folks. So I wanna give a few minutes. Uh, oh. if I was thinking, I just thought of something right now, uh, or, or while I'm, well, I will, I'm, I'm going to keep thinking about it. So sorry. Yeah, I, we can go ahead and do that. No, I love, I love hearing artists talk about the oh, awesome. something just came up for me. So yeah. for me, I would give one important thing about me as a disabled artist. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important that deaf, hard of hearing, deaf, blind people write scripts because when we write the script, it means that there's more deaf, hard of hearing and disabled people that get selected and asked to come into the work, to work backstage, to work as technicians for the play, as directors, as translators. I think that's something that I want to encourage people to do, especially um, mothers with disabilities to just write, you know, write the scripts, it really gives, um, and then we can work out about anything else that we might need like scheduling um, and accommodations mm -hmm. when it's coming from people like, people from the community who are putting in that kind of work. Yes. Oof. Um, yes, sorry, that took my breath away a little bit. It's essentially the access breeds access conversation that you just, pointed out so beautifully because that you know what you're identifying is so empowering folks will see it as oh but if we have to create access for this group then we have to create access for more groups and it's like that's exactly the point um so your call to action for um deaf blind um, um other artists with disabilities to write the scripts will demand for theaters to acknowledge this is the community to support in your space, always, because they will make it possible for those plays. Um, I just wanna thank you, yes to that. Um, incredible. Uh, and also, thank you, someone offered, we should also make a pitch for more matinees. Late nights are really rough. 
just want to honor that. <laughs> um, thank you for that drop in. Um, but thank you, Amy, uh, for sure. If we could populate the chat now with any questions that are in the room that you all have um, in terms of experience or recommendations on creating access, that would be wonderful. Um, if you are, if you have a question that you would like to ask anonymously, you are also welcome to, um, in terms of uh, sending a direct message to me, and I will share it into the space privately. Um, and I will start with my own question because I know it takes a while for the the text to come in. Um, in terms of creating um, more more opportunities for this conversation, um, Amy, you introduced the prompt of you know, hire more writers with disabilities. Um, what, are, what are other thoughts on how to create more opportunities for this conversation inside organizations? So it doesn't just stay on this PAL platform. The whole goal is that it breeds platform inside. Um, either and both, I invite to that conversation. I'll go first, if that's okay. This is Amy. <clears throat> Before COVID hit, I was offered a contract with a big theater, the American Play House. Um, it's in Wisconsin. And I've never, this company has never hired a deaf person before. I was the first time. I was really, they were really motivated to learn how to, you know, accommodate. But, um, I was I was hired as a cultural uh, um, cultural uh, advisor. They were basically like, "We'll pay you to interview <laughs> you on your experiences." Um, so I guess having a disability means there's a lot of emotional labor involved and they recognize that the, the emotional labor that is involved I taught them a lot it was a full day I mean it was a really cool experience they learned a lot and I was willing to I was you know they were willing to pay for that I got paid for that <laughs> yeah I, awesome as you should and I I love hearing that um <laughs> that your labor yeah had value that should be valued on on the budget line item that yes these opportunities for education um, of people's lived experiences need to be honored that way um that's awesome uh, we have a a question that i then we'll jump to you johanna if that's okay um because it's i believe it's inspired by amy's um recommendation um, in the chat, how do you think writers, how do you think theaters can find more writers with disabilities, not everyone identifies? Uh, we do have an organizational recommendation, um, if that's supportive. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts first, though. Um, uh, what is it called? HD. The American Theater of the Disabled of dis Disabled People. Yeah. There's some. There are so many theater uh, organizations and groups that you can look to. You get in touch with them, and you ask them. You know, where are your playwrights? Where are your writers? Uh, at festivals, you can meet people. Yeah. Festivals, and then uh, that's a. Or you, when you watch plays at festivals, you can say, "Oh, that was a really cool story." And you can get in touch with the person who wrote it. What did you write? And then you offer them an opportunity to write based on whatever theme that you're proposing, you're pitching. That's one, yeah. I don't know, I, we're not unicorns. <laughs> you can find us. Right. We are many, we are not rare. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah, and I would um, build, build beneath that too more organizations need to start self-identifying as institutions that want to create access. Because so often, you know, even with caregiver support, which is why we say, you know, like, don't just put it on the budget, put it on your EEO statement, put it, you know, your commitment to anti-discrimination um, against family responsibilities, put it on your audition calls that there is a childcare fund 
in this production. So you don't have to not audition for this piece. Um, uh, children are welcome in the audition space, et cetera. We have to flip the conversation from how do we find the artists who will expose themselves and their potentially very personal lived experiences for us to hire and put it on us to say, how do we expose ourselves as an institution who is learning in this area and wanting to grow? And if that feels vulnerable, I would just kind of flip the script back and say, imagine how vulnerable it feels on the individual to identify themselves for potential work because the risk needs to go to the institution where the risk is low because of the power dynamic and the resources are higher than on the individual to self-identify before the job comes in where the resources are low and the risks are high. Um, so I would encourage anyone who wants to take and should take Amy up on this challenge to hire more writers with disabilities, then identify yourself as an organization that's creating space and support for that and put in the work. And I promise you when you're forward facing with that, when you're public about putting in the work, the writers will seek you out as a safer space. Um, and that's, I believe that's the work that needs to happen before um, you start bringing folks in to hire because it will also reduce the harm that happens in the space. And Johanna, yes. Yeah, I mean, I'd really, I wanna plug our program that is coming yeah. up. We do an annual staged reading festival called Occupy the Stage. And within that, so I think one of the solutions is bulk. It's, it's you move the needle by increasing the number of playwrights who identify as blank, actors who identify as blank, by just upping the sheer numbers, right? Doing it at once. So Occupy the Stage is one of our, our attempts to solve that by having, this year we're going to do 23 staged readings in this festival. So 23 different plays. Last year we did 40. That was a little bit nuts on our, um, our in, internal bandwidth. So we're doing 23 this year. And we do ask player, and uh, Alana, like in terms of running an organization, the self-identifying part is, is the hardest part on all counts. And whether you're dealing with patrons or artists or administrators or whoever you're dealing with, like Rachel's saying is like that work to create the identif the place where people feel safe self-identifying. Um, it's, it's a very nuanced, multi-layered thing, but like simple things like asking people for their access needs um, when they buy a ticket. Do you have any access needs we can support? Um, uh, and in our Occupy the Stage submission form for directors and playwrights, we do have an open space we, where we say, we're asking you this question because we want to include as many um, intersectional voices as possible. So we invite you to share how you self-identify. And then when we create the program for Occupy the Stage, what we're trying to do, we uh, identify what are dis in, in the program, what are um, black stories, what are disabled stories, what are parent stories, so that potential producers can come and look at our program and, fi and find multiple <laughs> writers. <laughs> Who identify as disabled, multiple plays that have disability themes, multiple uh, playwrights who are people of color to choose from with multiple different types of stories, um, multiple, not just, we, we do, we have a rule called no one person team. So with any project we do, we try to balance not having just one of anything. So within the program, how many trans voices can we lift up? How many different voices in community can we lift up together? Um, and, and so like, that's a thing that we offer. So how do theaters like come to occupy the stage, tell the theaters that you know, tell the decision makers to come to occupy the stage um, and get access to 23 plays they might produce that are written by women or non-binary or trans people um, that have as many, at least 50% of them are writers of color and as many disabled and multi-identifying um, people as possible. So yeah, I think that's a great solution. Not, it's not the only one, but it's a solution. Yeah, that sounds like um, intentionality. <laughs> 
go to the spaces that are safe for these folks and learn from them. Don't just grab from them, learn from them. How are they creating safe spaces for this art to happen? Um, I also want to honor in the chat, a uh, thank you to the participant who asked the question about hiring more writers with disabilities, um, who identifies as a playwright with a disability. Um, I received that adjustment, thank you. Um, so I offered the challenge to organizations and also to folks, um, we get this in the caregiver conversation a lot and the intersection of, of identifying yourself to an employer. I just wanna relieve anyone of the burden of feeling that that obligation is yours to, um, to speak up and like, uh, you know, pre-employment identify um, in a way for your employer to feel more prepared. Um, do that insofar as it supports you as the individual. The obligation is really on the organization to have the legal and ethical and compassionate work and education done on their part to be ready for you and not for you to risk discrimination in employment when you feel unsafe in the interview or the audition process. And I just wanna encourage everyone that way and also um, recommend our PAL handbook on the page because um, too many theaters do not have HR. And so the possibility for discrimination is very real. So I wanna invite any questions about that into the space um, mm -hmm. that we can help support because as we're having this conversation, it's great to feel that, oh, there's gonna be more employment possibilities but this growth period that should last forever, because um, we should be growing forever, of inviting more access needs into our spaces um, also requires compliance and an education on how to reduce harm and treat people legally in terms of the hiring process. You know, it's not just a group of friends making art. It's, this is a professional situation and it needs to be treated that way. Um, a question in the chat. I also think direct reach out to the communities through fellowships, mentorships, workshops. Yeah, exactly like Johanna is talking about real concrete programs that people can um, take advantage of to find new diverse talent. Um, yeah, 100%. And that's also a call to all of us to, um, you know, not just buy tickets to the theaters doing the glory projects of like we hired a writer with a disability for this play. It's fine, but seek out the programs, you know, like Occupy the Stage or seek out the theaters, you know, that Amy, you mentioned created great support for you, like OSF, OSF and be, be a, a patron there, <laughs> buy those tickets. If you really know an organization is investing in their budget culturally to create interconnected access for folks with disability and caregiver support. Um, in the chat we have, I'd like to add that the size of the disabled population is only growing. Autism numbers, longer lives, um, orgs that recognize that are, uh, I would say ahead of the curve, yeah, and the curve is behind progress for sure. Um, and in terms of the population, uh, the disabled population growing, we're also, uh, I would say, growing in our understanding on how to identify um, folks with disabilities and create support for that. Like Amy keeps saying, we're there. <laughs> it's not that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, oh they exist once I learn about it it's um we've always it and the question is will we uh, recognize it um it's important the statistic the working statistic is that 25 percent of people will become disabled at some point in their lives so in any room where four or more are gathered chances are there is a disabled person in that room, whether they self-identify that way or not. And in terms of what Rachel's talking about, the compassion meter, if we just enter our rooms in live, in person or virtual with the understanding um, and ready to be compassionate around one in four is going to be disabled. One in four uh, women in my room is going to have experienced an abortion and or some form of sexual violence. Like just, just enter the room knowing that these, that these numbers mean that, that in your, if you just put it into the one in four or the one in five or the, just know that your room is full of people who need you to apply tenderness for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. 100%. Um, a question that I'll offer to both of you is um, what are some budget line items or uh, a space access 
that you would love to see become more common in theaters. And we can take a pause for you to think about that as well if it's supported. And Amy, we'll start with you. <clears throat> um, let me think. When you say that, you mean um, separ uh, separating the line items of disability access and caregiver access? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, any and all. If you could create a dream budget, what would be on your list? Hmm, wow. Amy, if you want me to go first while you're thinking, I, have, <laughs> I can rattle them off like it's Christmas morning, the things I want. Uh, well, first of all, here in the Raleigh Triangle area, not everyone even uses ADA compliant venues in our area. It's not even totally a thing. So like just the bare minimum compliant spaces would be great. Um, that's number one. But to my dream is to have productions that have that are fully integrated access productions. So like every production has integrated captioning, has integrated uh, tactile experiences, has integrated interpretation, has integrated uh, parent access points, whatever those may be. Um, that just the whole thing has been thought of from a multiplicity of viewpoints and needs and for, you know, for just everyone. So I'm like, I mean, I just, I want my whole budget to be an access budget, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just want us all to be thinking about what that's like, like, what is it like um, to not just have one sensory friendly performance, but an entire experience that is relaxed enough for people with sensory sensitivities to always feel welcome in your space. Like, what does that look like? And what do you need to make it so? Yeah. I want it all. Yes. Yes. Um, it's it's uh, the difference, you know, between um, inclusion as a project and inclusion as practice. It sounds like, you know, inclusion as a project is like, you know, we start off with the pilot of, okay, we're going to intentionally start hiring and creating safer spaces for X. But the question we want to challenge people, especially with this summit is, how are you making, you know, what you're talking about, integrating access, the practice for the rest of your organization's life, lifespan, learn on the small scale, but then apply it on the larger scale as a, as a continued um, commitment, for sure. Um, and Amy, yeah, the application of the question can even be as a mother artist, you know, very, um, which is something we, uh, we care very much to hear about from you in terms of what you what you seek on a budget line item. I'm thinking about my dream budget and it's different as a parent, really, the idea for what support we need. Some prefer just to leave children home with a caretaker and other people want to bring their children um, to go see um, a play or for an audition or um, it varies. So really my three-year-old, she just doesn't want to go to auditions or rehearsal rooms at all. She will destroy the machines. Um, so, but my baby's a different story and parents themselves are different. So Joanna and I, we, we have sons who are the same age, around the same age, eight and nine, but they both have different needs. So, you know, it really varies parent to parent. My daughter is deaf. 
my my bro, my daughter is deaf and my son is hearing, so they need different things. So it's not going to be a one budget fits all sort of thing. It has the budget itself has to be flexible to accommodate for different situations that might come up for different families. I think that's beautiful, um, and also a great recommendation <laughs> to make sure that your your budget has enough give to uh, support the people who enter your space, um, as opposed to the people having to be the ones to be flexible and give of their lives for the budget to take precedence. Um, I thought of something else I want in my dream budget. I want a housekeeping budget because my, like, I can do my theater work and I can almost be an okay parent, but I can't also keep my house clean on top of all these things. Like I, like that is, feels like an access need for my family lately is who's going to clean our house. <laughs> That's huge. I know that like a lot of dispelling myths and rumors is, is me being like, Hey, behind this blue screen and underneath this zoom line right here. Uh, yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. And it, how can we establish that as the professional standard? You know, that's what it, like that's what a professional's life looks like and we can't expect we can't expect folks to get everything done as though it it was no problem at all individually and like peeling back that mask um we're going to stop the stream at this point for the last 10 minutes for any um private or um more intimate conversation that may come up um, and so I just want to thank everyone for joining us on the live stream and those of you in our space, um, please feel free to stay for the next 10 minutes and